Hello, welcome to this screencast on frequency response functions, which is part of the course Dynamics and Control of Mechanical Systems. Today I will introduce the concept of frequency response function and frequency response function matrix. Let me start with the single degree of freedom system. As you know, for a single degree of freedom system, this is the equation of motion. And if we consider harmonic excitation as given here, this uh, uh, force can also be written as the real part of a complex force amplitude times e to the power of j omega t. And here you see this f hat is a complex amplitude. And then the response is the steady state response of the system. And we look like this, uh, also cosinus omega t plus a phase. And it can also be written as the real part of this uh, q hat with uh, e to the power of j omega t. Let us take an intermezzo. So this is only to remind you that when we have an e to the power of a sum of two constants, a plus b, that's the same as the product of these two. And the second thing is that an exponential function e to the power of jx is in fact the same as cosinus x plus j sinus x, which is with j squared equal to minus one. So we go back to the single degree of freedom system. And what we do is substitute the uh, force and the response in the equations of motion. That is what you see here. And we take the real part. And then, because this equation has to be valid for any time t, then we can eliminate the e to the power of j omega t, and we end up having this relationship that q hat is equal to f hat divided by minus m omega squared plus k. And from here we define the frequency response function which is capital H of omega and that is 1 divided by min, min, minus m omega squared plus k. This is the frequency response function. So what we have done here is go from a representation in time domain to a representation in frequency domain. The question is, how does this function look like? If we plot it in a linear scale, it would look like this. So we see a peak that goes to infinity at the eigenfrequency of the system, which is a square root of k divided by m. But outside this peak, we don't see much in this linear scale. So in dynamics, normally we will plot it like this in a logarithmic scale for the i-axis. So x-axis stays the same, and in the y-axis we use a logarithmic scale. Then you see we see the curve much better. Again, at the resonance peak, the response goes to infinity. We don't see it go to infinity because we have a um, limited delta f there. Uh, so only if we hit the resonance when we do the calculation in MATLAB, it will go to infinity. And in this course, on part B, as you know, you will uh, start learning about uh, control. And in control, normally, you will plot this like this. So that is the log-log scale. So both the x-axis, the frequency, and the y-axis, the magnitude of the frequency response function, are in a logarithmic scale. Let us now go to the multi-degree of freedom system. So if we consider the multi-degree of freedom system, then what we would like to know is what is the relationship between the generalized forces and the generalized um, coordinates. And these two are the complex amplitude of both, as you can read there. In the following, I will drop the substrate zero here and the substrate one. But remember that to come here, we first linearized. So this matrix 
I will call it M and K, but those are the linear M and K matrices. And this Q double dot, I will drop the one, but it's still a small oscillation around the equilibrium. So if we assume harmonic excitation, then for the generalized forces, we can do the same as we just did for the force. Eh? Uh, it's a cosinus type of function, and it is the real part of this Q hat, uh, e to the power of j omega t, etc. And if we have this excitation, then the response will have exactly the same form with a, another uh, phase shift. And this can also be written as a real part of q hat e to the power of j omega t with q hat uh, given here. So we substitute this in the equation of motion and we find a relationship between the complex amplitude of the response and the complex amplitude of the excitation. And this, <laughs> you see it here, is the frequency response function matrix. This is a matrix. And this matrix will, of course, be uh, singular at the natural frequencies. So that means the response tends to infinity, exactly the same as for the single degree of freedom system. So let us look at this matrix with an example. And the example we will consider is this uh, Trudov system. You see we have two masses. Uh, mass 1 is connected to the fixed world with a spring K1, and max, mass 2 is connected to mass 1 with a spring K2. And uh, X1 and X2 are absolute coordinates. Uh, X2 is defined with respect to the fixed world. And then we can, in principle, we can have a force acting on uh, coordinate 1, and we can also have a force acting on coordinate 2. These are the matrices that correspond to this system. The uh, column of generalized coordinates in general will look like this. We can have a force 1 and we can have a force 2. And if we now consider the complex amplitude of these forces, so we go directly to harmonic excitation, then it will look like this. And the response then will be like this. So this x a hat and x1 hat, x2 hat are the complex amplitudes of the response. And uh, this omega between brackets is to stress the fact that, the, that these quantities are frequency dependent. In this case, the frequency response function matrix is a two by two matrix. So the frequency response function matrix will always have the same size as number of degrees of freedom we have. And how, how does this uh, matrix uh, look like? Well, it will look like this. Eh? So I said it's two by two. So if we put x1, x2 here, it, it will be equal to the AH matrix times the forces. And it has four elements h11, h12, h21, h22. And important about this matrix is that it is symmetric. So h21 and h12 are the same due to the reciprocity condition. So what are these uh, terms in the frequency response function matrix? If we consider the first column, then we see that H11 is the ratio of X1 to F1 when force 2 is 0. And for H21, it's the same thing, but it is the ratio between X2 and F1. So the first column, we can obtain it when we set force 2 to 0. In the same way, for the second column, we set force 1 to 0, and H12 is the ratio of X1 to F2, and H22 is the ratio of X2 to F2. And in this way, we can understand the whole matrix. But the next question is, how does this um, look like if we make plots? It looks like this. 
So let me uh, walk you through it. As you see, as I said, H21 and H12 are the same. This should always be the case. And then here we have H11 and here we have H22. And the next thing we do is try to understand what we see. So the first obvious thing to see that the uh, first peak here in both graphs, in fo all four graphs, corresponds to the first eigenfrequency of the system. And the response goes to infinity in principle. And if we don't see it go to infinity in the plots, it's because of the uh, delta F, delta omega, uh, we use to make the plots here. The next peak is the second eigenfrequency of the system. And this system has two degrees of freedom, so we will find two eigenfrequencies. The other interesting thing about these plots is that we see that close to zero, we get a horizontal uh, line. And what is the height of this line? Well, when the frequency goes to zero, h tends to the inverse of k. And for this particular example, these are the values. So if we calculate the inverse of k, we find these values, and that is exactly what you see here when the frequency goes to zero. But what happens now if we remove the spring here? So we have a system now with a rigid body mode. The first eigenfrequency of the system is zero. So how do you think these plots will look like? Like this. Obviously, we just said at the eigenfrequencies of the system, the response goes to infinity. So in this case, because we have this eigenfrequency at omega is uh, zero, then the uh, stiffness uh, uh, matrix, eh? the, um, the determinant of the stiffness matrix is zero. So the inverse of the stiffness matrix um, that all the com elements, as you see there, tend to infinity. So when we have a rigid body mode, we will see uh, this behavior. As a uh, last detail regarding this, these plots I just showed you for the rigid body mode correspond to the situation with two absolute coordinates. X2 is defined as an absolute coordinate uh, with respect to a fixed world. My question to you is, if we defined X2 as a relative coordinate, what happens to H? How will it look like? Think about it. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye bye.